So very good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to this eminent science lecture under the SRTP program. We have indeed a very eminent speaker today uh, from ISER Bhopal and you will hear more about the speaker in a while. But before that, I'd like to uh, share with you and the audience who's connected on the digital platform, either YouTube or Facebook or through MS Teams. This program, which is called the Summer Research Training Program of the CSIR, a very unique initiative taken by CSIR for students and young faculty who are stranded in their homes and unable to go to the laboratories, uh, especially the undergraduate and postgraduate students who wanted to do internships, but were unable to visit the labs due to this uh, pandemic. Uh, so CSI took up this challenge and uh, taking a technological solution for this challenge. Uh, Dr. Shastri, the director of NIST, uh, along with his team, uh, set up a portal uh, in the first week of June and they opened it for a week. And within the week, we got almost 16,000 people to sort of <coughs> sign in on this portal and get registered. These were students as well as faculty who wanted to understand the different uh, disciplines and dimensions of science. And since then, we've had more than 40 lectures given by various uh, scientists uh, from disciplines ranging from physics to chemistry to biology and geology and so forth. Um, astrophysics, astronomy, you know, ISRO, you name it and we've had it. And we are indeed very fortunate today to have a very uh, eminent speaker again. And that should add to the uh, value of this program, uh, but also I think will open more dimensions for the students who are seeking uh, pursue science as a career. Uh, so without much ado, I would request uh, Dr. Shastri to kindly uh, introduce the speaker of eminence today. Dr. Shastri, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's indeed a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Umapati, whom I know for more than 20 years, uh, 25, 30 years. And I have been very keenly following his research. And if there is somebody who is a person clearly taking the legacy of Professor Raman in India, it is Professor Umapati. And he is uh, really pioneer in spectroscopy, physical chemistry, and then tracing them with computational chemistry and he is bestowed with very important awards and more importantly he is an internationally recognized person in the area of Raman spectroscopy. One of the first to receive the Swarnajayanti Fellowship which was introduced by uh, uh, Sri Bharat Ratna Bihari Vajpayee in uh, 1998. And then he is also a Bhatnagar Awardee and fellow of many academies. And uh, recently he was also a Jesse Bose fellow. And more importantly, he has uh, many awards after Professor C.V. Raman, C.V. Raman Young Scientist Award from the Government of Karnataka. And uh, he is on the editorial boards of several journals like in Faraday Discussions, the Journal of Raman Spectroscopy, Chemical Physics, Nature Scientific reports, frontiers in physics, and I have the opportunity to listen to him, and he is a very, very passionate speaker, and I have requested him to come and then speak to all our SRTP students, and thank you very much, sir, for accepting our request, and it was a very, very good occasion for all of us to listen from Professor Umapati, who is uh, an internationally recognized uh, spectroscopist that the country has produced. And before I ask Professor Umapati to give his lecture, I ask Swapnali Hazarika to request Professor Umapati to release a few videos which were made on the occasion of this SRP. Swapnali, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And good morning, one and all. On behalf of Director CSIR NIST, Dr. Z. Narahari Sastri and CSIR SRTP 2020 team, we are organizing committee have pro prepared more than 100 videos which covers up all the institute instrumental facilities available at CSIR NIST Zorhat. So it's our immense pleasure to prevail the learning techniques of different experimental demonstration 
throughout their working principle for every individual stuck at home in the current pandemic time. Uh, till date, sir, we have released total of 35 videos and we have also received large number of viewers and supporters with a large number of valuable and encouraging mm -hmm. comments. Today, sir, we are going to release the video of demonstration on Roman spectrometer. Uh, so, sir, with uh, due permission from you and on behalf of you, we would like to release the video for public by clicking the link on the video. Sir, should I proceed? Yeah, please, all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Swapnali. Now I request of Srumapati to proceed with his lecture. Thank you very okay. much, Mr. Uh, so anyway, thank you to Dr. Shastri for uh, organizing this and Dr. Alok Dhawan for participating. Um, so I'm going to just uh, briefly uh, give a lecture about what I gave uh, a few years ago to uh, students in uh, IAC in our department to motivate them to understand the challenges in, uh, in uh, uh, doing research, uh, particularly for, uh, for our students. And uh, more importantly, this also actually contains uh, some guidelines uh, to students and young people about the career. Uh, so let's uh, start with the question, um, the, the, the question of the title of the talk. Uh, so we'll start with this. So the question is, what does it take to be a scientist, a good scientist that is? Um, so a scientist basically, in general, a broad guideline is, uh, uh, what he does is research to advance knowledge or develop technology. Um, now, most scientists, if you see, uh, give me the remote to go to the next one. Uh, most scientists uh, have certain, uh, uh, typically what they do is uh, uh, they look at, uh, uh, first they have curiosity. Uh, I'm giving a broad outline that we'll go into the detail. And they have ability to observe things in much more details than a normal person. And then having observed and asking the question, then they frame the question of what they want to do. And that's a very difficult thing. It's not a straightforward thing to do. And then after the question is asked, then how do I solve the problem? So you have to develop methods and then conduct experiment accurately so that everybody in the world can do what you have done. Uh, and then uh, you come up with the discovery or invention and then you solve the problem. So what is typically um, uh, guys, uh, you know, scientists have the, the habits, uh, what we call the seven habits of the scientist, basically the philosophy of research. Why? So, so, you know, so the question is the philosophy, you know, and then your personality and your ability to motivate yourself and persevere. And then there are a lot of issues of uh, success and failures. And how do you manage yourself, manage your project? And not only that, having done the research, it's also important to communicate with people and tell people about what you have done. 
and uh, and then the definition of success whether you have achieved something or not so if you if you actually go through that so we can ask the question what what is it i want to do now many a times uh, people do not think about this very seriously uh, whether it is uh, science or any other profession um, you must have a conviction that what you have learned or what you want to do is very clear in your mind or if you are not sure you let an experienced person to make the choice for you um, and then having decided what you want to do then the next question is where most people uh, falter in creativity is why am i doing what question or why am i asking this question or what project i'm doing why am i doing this i think that is where one has to be very clear that i'm trying to solve a problem of this kind which is necessary uh, generally people just don't even think they just moving and start doing what is given to them right and then your creativity comes in the creativity is more like you know it's it's not a routine uh, logic uh, people get confused between uh, lateral thinking versus logical thinking now logical thinking any person with a good common sense with the depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge can ask or give you lateral thinking is the kind of questions that you experience in aptitude tests uh, or iq tests where it's not straight the answer is not simply logical enough it's also lateral Uh, anybody interested in lateral thinking can actually find a book by Edward de Bono, which is uh, available uh, everywhere. Uh, he gave up this idea of lateral thinking in the 1980s, and we can look at that. The next is originality. You know what is what is that we uh, original about this work? Now, unfortunately, this is a very confused word in research or in in life. When you when you say somebody is original. Uh, we think that if somebody has done an experiment uh, in semiconductor physics using cadmium sulfide and then somebody will say okay he has done cadmium sulfide let me do cadmium oxide or zinc sulfide without any logic so that is not original so you know just just changing little bit of something which is already existing and then trying to do something is not very original original means that is a logic on and, and a creative thinking by which you ask the right question something is not working so why is it not working so how can i solve this problem can i come up with a new set of or new ways in which uh, i can solve this problem which is something that other people have not tried and also you know it is something that there is a scientific and technological reason that if you try that there is a good reason to uh, come up with a solution that is something that uh, you know most people do not understand and so originality doesn't mean uh minor changes originality actually means uh coming up with an idea or innovative way of doing it so what is innovation so if you look at innovation the idea that you come up with must be disruptive you know what is a disruptive idea many of you may not know uh because most of you are born in the in the 90s and 2000 you know before that we had telephones where it's all connected by wires right so now all of you are carrying a mobile phone now the mobile phone has changed the culture of the world mobile phone has changed the way that people do uh, business uh, people communicate people interact um, the digitization has changed the way that you even think i mean people sleep with mobile phones get up with mobile phones now when there was a phone unless the phone rings you don't communicate with anybody so the mobile phone was a disruptive idea so that is a reno- you know innovation which is a lead to a paradigm shift enormous social impact but if you look at uh, if you want to come up with something like this a person must have a free mind what what is the meaning of free now so in order to come up with a good innovation you need to have uh, first of all a free mind not a predetermined mind you know not to assume that i want to publish a paper in 6 months or i want to get a award or i want to do this before this time you must have a open mind saying let me solve the problem and that that is that is free mind and you can't work under pressure you know you can't say you know i can give the result by tomorrow so that's that's one thing the second thing is you must have a depth of knowledge if you do not have a depth of knowledge your question is not going to be correct your analysis is not going to be correct so you need to that is why we always tell students you must read you must read in the subject where you come from so go back and read review articles papers fundamental aspects in uh, books 
to learn, make sure every word that you don't understand, you should go back and read for your, your own benefit. Uh, that is why we say that you must be motivated to do something. And then I will go into the others, uh, the, the uh, perseverance and risk evaluation. So I call this, this creativity as an innovation triangle. We have these three C's, the culture, character, and consciousness. Um, so I will go through this as we go along. Uh, the consciousness is the fact that you're doing it for yourself and you are honest to yourself and you, you realize that I have not read enough. So you say, sorry, I don't know. When you don't know something, so let me go back and learn. And also you must be conscious about what you're trying to deliver and deadlines. And we have a tendency to agree with the boss as soon as he calls and says, can you give it tomorrow? We say, yes, I'll give. But if he cannot give, we should say, sorry, sir, I cannot give you tomorrow. So the conscious effort is very important. The character, character has to be positive and you know, and then something, something you must make sure that I, I will, I will discuss this uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. You must have a strong willed character to deliver what you want or what you're looking for. The culture is, is more a unique aspect for India. Uh, if you look at uh, our culture, uh, we get confused between culture, mixing culture, personal life versus professional life. Now, um, if you actually uh, look at uh, our culture, it says that you must respect all elders. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't disagree with them, but you can disagree with them politely and you tell them, uh, I agree, sir, but I don't know. I have an alternate idea. What do you think? Um, that kind of discussions are lacking in many places. Um, the other problem is obedience. If somebody tells you something that you don't agree with, uh, you don't have to just accept because I have to be obedient. If your consciousness says, look, I think uh, I'm not sure it's the correct thing to do, you must express yourself so that you know, in an experiment, you, if, the, if the professor says, look, I think you should get good signals here. Why are you not getting? You can't go back and say, okay, I'll try again. You have to say, look, I tried the following. I'm not getting signal. I don't know what I'm missing. Can you please tell me what is, what is going wrong? So you must express yourself consciously. The other thing we always mix up today, in, uh, which is I think more and more people have started talking about is uh, what is your rank in the class? The rank in the class is only to get admission, you know, but in research or in your profession, uh, I don't think anybody will ask you what was your rank in your 12th standard, what was your rank in BSc? Nobody will ask the question. They will ask you what is that you've learned. So what is important is in addition to rank, you have to worry about knowledge. So it's all around the top 30%, 40% of your class. If your knowledge is very strong, uh, I think you have a better chance of getting a job rather than the rank in class. And then there's also the problem of jealousy and competitiveness. I think that actually uh, doesn't allow you to have a free mind. Uh, you can't compete with your colleagues. You can't compete with your friends. You, you have to work, work as a team. So that's what it says next line, competition versus teamwork. So if you can actually be have an open-minded approach, both uh, both uh, with your colleagues, with your competitors, and uh, you have to let it say, okay, if you're smarter than me, I'm happy to see you do very well, because that way both of you can teach each other lots of good things. And that is something is, is something one has to be conscious about while you're working. Of course, there are always people who are negative. And uh, if you look at uh, this in terms of values that you develop, um, you know, in a, in a country like India, we, we can always complain about everything around us. And, uh, you know, you, you can say that the bus didn't come on time, the conductor did not give me enough money, uh, you know, it was raining when I came. You know, those kind of attitude is never good because when you actually walk in, you look at the positive side and make friends who are positive. Uh, that is very important. In addition, this is where you are emotional. So the IQ and EQ, IQ is the intelligent quotient. EQ is the emotional quotient. So intelligent quotient is something all of you are familiar with because you write exams, uh, how much you learn, how well quickly you learn, all that. Emotional quotient is about understanding the emotions of the other people and therefore play and behave as a team, uh, not necessarily as a selfish person. So if your IQ and EQ are at the correct level, then you are likely to do very well in a, in a very creative environment. Um, now, many a times you will see somebody maybe have very good IQ, but very low EQ. And those people, I'm sure you will find in your life, they might have been topper of your class, but never become uh, done very well uh, 10, 15 years later, 
because their EQ is very low. They are very selfish, jealous, and cunning, and they never move on in life. But people with very good EQ and good average good IQ will, will become much more successful. And this is very well known. And uh, there are perceptions and misconceptions uh, about what we understand about the world around us. Now, for example, if you look at this picture, um, if, if you're familiar with it, you, you can see the horses. And then you can also see the snow and you can see the rocks. Um, if, you're, if you observe very carefully, you can count the number of horses. And if you spend enough time, you will see there are uh, five horses that you can, you can count. But that kind of observation skill is only possible if you know what a horse looks like. For example, this is a very big horse. You can see there is another big horse here. And there is a small horse here. You can see the face here and then the body. Now, you know what a horse looks like. You know what a big horse looks like and what a small horse looks like. Then you're able to make a decision when you look at a picture saying, I can see horses. But if you've never seen a horse before, you will never even understand. You will think it is some sort of a snow and rocks, right? So research is something like that. When you're doing an experiment or when you're trying to solve a problem, you will only recognize it if you know previously your basics are very strong. And if it is not there, you will not even see the result which is existing. That is why people say innovation, disruptive technologies come with experience. Nobel laureates, you know, they are able to recognize a, a fantastic output, but average scientists cannot because they're chasing papers, they are chasing time, chasing awards. Therefore, they, they don't recognize even when they have good results in front of them. So this is important for observation and, and depth of knowledge. In terms of perception, we, we think that a scientist room should look like this, should be chaotic, you know, unconnected, dirty, uh, because they're so busy in doing something. That doesn't have to be true. There are people with uh, very good clean offices. There are people with uh, not not so clean offices. So that way we should make sure that you know our understanding is realistic, not just some sort of a, a cliche. And to give you an example of, of reality of life, look at this picture. Now here, uh, there are these uh, uh, bears in, in Antarctica are playing around in the water, they love ice, and uh, uh, they like to have uh, in, in cold water ice. And then you have uh, the shipwreck, which is because of the ice, uh, the, the ship hit the ice and it got shipwrecked. Now, people generally, all of us will say, my God, you know, ship is wrecked, it's so dangerous, it's not good. And then the bears think, uh, finally, we thought we'll enjoy ourselves with the ice look at this board came and disturbed our eyes. So that is the perception. So depending on which side of the uh, side you're you are supporting or thinking about, you will see different meaning for the same thing. So when, if, you are, if you are positive, you will you will assume that you will agree with, uh, with the fact that uh, different people have different views on the same issues and you have to agree to disagree on it and move on rather than holding grudges and, and cunning. The other thing that you also say is that you know, this is some sort of a vision that people have. I want to do theory and I want to look like this as if I don't care about dressing and stuff like that. And it's drawn by one of my students when I was when I was talking to them. Uh, so he gave it to me. I said, I'll use this. So uh, this is this is all, you know, perception. I don't think it matters whether you are a theory student or an experimentalist, whether you dress up well or not well, all these. And that is something that people have to be conscious about. This is, this is the other thing about motivation and perseverance. This is, this is the toughest part of, of the whole lot. In any profession, right? the most important thing is you have to ask the question, am I learning every day? Am I enjoying learning? You know, that, that is important. If you don't enjoy learning, uh, if you don't enjoy what you do, you won't be motivated. You'll only be motivated when you start enjoying learning. And also willing to share knowledge. Now, for example, some people are good at certain aspects of life. Uh, some people are good at experiments. Some people are good at theory. Uh, some people are good at computers. Some people are good at Excel. Some people are good at PowerPoints. Now, you know, everybody cannot be expert on everything. So one way to live and be successful or be positive is to share knowledge. So if you have good friends with people and somebody knows something better 
And so if you're open to them, they're willing to teach you and you can teach what you know. And so both of you go up in life and that is more important. The other thing is the tolerance for frustration, right? So you, you can understand, for example, in real life, um, in, in your own family, your brothers, sisters, or extremely close friends, the level of tolerance for their behavior is very high. When you like someone, uh, you tolerate them very, very, uh, 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 quite a lot. But if you don't, if you're not sure, if you don't know somebody, then you get irritated pretty quickly. You get upset about somebody, right? So research is something like that, because what happens is you try something, you fail something. You have to accept if you love research, that failure will not be an extremely uh, difficult thing. You will say, OK, I failed. Let me take a break for a day. I'll come back and think about it, right? So the tolerance level for research has to be very high. And of course, I already told you, the competition must be healthy. The competition is not healthy, then you're going to have a much more difficult, uh, difficult time. Um, so now, what what are the what are the uh, problems in, in fun and pain? That the fun part is actually getting uh, results, the results that nobody has ever seen. You are the first person to see the experimental result that's coming out, or when you're working in an office, you are the first person to come up with something that nobody has thought of which gives you satisfaction and all that. And also when you get success, before you announce the success to the world, you must analyze, have I understood the success very well? There's a very famous story. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. There was a young ambitious boy who joined a biology group and uh, they were doing behavioral biology uh, of, of animals. And so they were trying this uh, frog experiment. So this boy is a first year student who thought that he is going to become a Nobel laureate. So he told this uh, professor saying, I want to do a behavioral experiment with my frog. He said, go ahead. So what he did, he cut one leg and told the frog jump. The frog jumped about, uh, you know, uh, about a meter or something. He, uh, he cut two legs and say, and then touched and said jump. And he jumped about uh, two feet. And then he cut three legs and he jumped about 10 centimeter and he got four legs and it wasn't jumping. He kept shouting jump, but it wasn't jumping. So he was so excited, went to the professor and said, wow, I found something amazing. He said, what happened? The, the frogs are deaf. He said, why are they deaf? He said, well, when, when all four legs are cut, the, dog, the frogs cannot hear anymore. So he, the professor was shocked and said, that's not the point, the point is, since you have cut all the four legs, it doesn't have a way to jump any longer. So the judgment is wrong, analysis was wrong. So that kind of analysis is very dangerous. That means you haven't understood uh, what are the processes involved in a frog jumping. Without understanding, you start doing experiment, you will get into trouble. Uh, the other part, which is very, I think, changing in India recently slowly, but it is changing. Uh, there's a tendency to publish large number of papers nobody reads. Uh, that is that is no use. If you're a scientist, you must ask the question, can I submit to the best journals rather than can I submit and publish it? Um, that I think you must have a patience and time. Uh, I can tell you, University of California, for example, have now removed all parameters used for evaluating publications, like impact factor, H index and all that. Uh, all, you know, all universities under California has, been, has agreed to do that. Uh, so I'm hoping in India also we will do that someday. But, but the point is that just publishing is not enough, but the quality publication is important. And then you have to have your peers must respect you. The uh, peers in the world, uh, we have large number of people uh, who are world famous in India, but not outside India. Uh, what is more important is you must be world famous in the world, not, not within your own institution or within your own country. And that only comes by quality work and quality output in, in the best journals that are possible in the world. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, doing research is not straightforward. Um, you have to do management, right? So whether you are a student, whether you are a professor, uh, you need to learn to manage the human resource, human resource or your colleagues, uh, your technical assistants in the laboratory. Uh, if you are nice to them, you are humane, you discuss with them and you help them, they help you, you will do very well. And you have to do the project management. When you say project management, you must have a clear plan on what you're going to do. What are the steps? Do I have enough material already available? Do I have to order something? 
you know, so you need to plan. You, you need to uh, take a notebook and write, so this is the experiment I want to do. These are the items I need. In, in, this is what level of changes I may happen, so I need to buy all of these. So successful people, uh, professors uh, who can manage finances very well, will plan very well. We normally plan three years, four years ahead. We plan projects, uh, uh, research topics ahead, and therefore we prepare the materials ahead. So the students do not have uh, too much problems in the lab. Because if you don't plan, suddenly you start the experiment, there is no money, uh, and then uh, everybody gets stuck. Uh, and then your experiment you started will fail because you don't have enough material. So that kind of project planning is important. And then finance planning. You know, do I have enough money to employ somebody? Do I have enough money to pay fellowships? Um, all that, if you don't have enough funds, if the funds is going to finish next year or year after, uh, you need to sit and write proposals or write competitive exams, get fellowships, all that has to be done. All these has to be administered. You know, when you're using taxpayers' money, there, is the, there, is, there are mechanisms by which to spend the money. You can't just go ahead and do what you like. And that is something that most people don't understand. They think that given the money, they can do what they want. Now, when you spend taxpayers' money, the taxpayers want to know whether you honestly spent it. Have you delivered something? So there are checks and balances set up by Government of India and the rules and regulations all over the world is the same. Uh, if you see the finance management and administration, uh, whether it is Europe or US, the rules are very similar. The procedures are very similar, but we, you know, there are people, efficiency may be different in different countries. But still, the, the, the financial justification and expenses has to be monitored. The other thing is marketing. How do you market your product? That means something you've discovered is basically is marketing, sharing with people. You can do that by publishing in top journals, or by going to conferences and giving lectures or putting uh, posters in meetings. So it is important to communicate with the world about what you're doing. Doing it alone in your own office and you know trying to say I have done well uh, is, is no use because then what you have done is no use to the society, no use to advance knowledge in the world or in the country uh, if you're doing it on your own. Uh, so that is, that is very important. The other thing is communication. As you're saying about marketing, uh, one of the things is when people give talks, uh, what they don't understand, they don't think about the audience. They just think, prepare what they know. So the presentation is prepared with material that is they are aware. So one of the things you have to do is you must make sure that who are the audience going to be? Are they going to be students who do not understand my subject? So in most places, you will have almost 70 to 80% of people who don't know what you're going to talk about. Another 20% who probably know your subject. So what you need to do, you address the 80% in the first half an hour, you address the other 20% in the next half an hour. So you need to prepare a talk very well so that people understand what you're trying to do, why you're doing something and what you've got. So that people who are not in the field learn something. And when you talk about what you've achieved, people who are in the field understand how you've achieved something and what you've done. The other thing is explanation and discussions. Many a times, what I have noticed, which is very common, is that when somebody asks a question, people do not even think. They just answer them without thinking what the question is about. And then, you know, it, it's all right to have an, you know, a discussion where there's a disagreement. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody says, I don't agree with your discussion, you can say, thank you, sir. I have a different opinion, but maybe we can discuss this after the seminar. Um, you don't have to get offended, you don't get, get upset, because this is part of uh, any uh, creative endeavor where only uh, differences and uh, discussions will lead to creativity. If everybody agrees with what you say, that means nobody is thinking apart from you. And if there are people disagreeing with you and gives you alternate views, that gives you an alternate approach to solve a problem. So it is very important. And the questions during the seminar, you see, because English is not our mother tongue, so many a times all of us translate our questions from our mother tongue to English. And sometimes the grammar between our mother tongue and English are very different. So you end up sounding very rude. Um, you know, so I can give you examples, but I'm sure the students are aware. So you need to make sure that you, you uh, ask the questions very politely and then do not argue beyond a point uh, with the speaker and you have to agree at the point and give it up, right? And uh, and that that is, and then you can see this 
you, if you attend international conferences, you have to observe these things very carefully. What questions are asked and what what is being what is being said, right? And um, finally, I'm going to go skip a few and I'm going to go to the success part. What is more important is is not about fame and money. Uh, fame and money are, are temporary success. You know, they, uh, fame will last for a few days, money will last for a few weeks. What lasts for you is contentment, uh, satisfaction, happiness, and your friends respect you. Uh, your fellows who are uh, people who are with you uh, are also uh, appreciate what you do and what uh, how you have done that. And that's what is going to keep you motivated forever. Um, uh, this is uh, this may sound like as if uh, it's all ideal thing. Actually, it is not ideal. It is that you need to change your personality because all these factors will decide your creativity. If you if you are contented, satisfied, and happy, you'll be the most creative. Uh, because I can give you examples. If you remember back, go back to your college days, uh, study days, you will see that. When you're happy and study, you can learn even complex stuff in a very short time and you'll feel happy after learning. it. But if you're angry, upset with something and try to study, you will never go through more than three or four pages, even after three, four hours. So that is that is typical of anybody who want to be creative. It's important to make an effort. Keep keep looking at this and say I should be. It's OK. Something went wrong. I, I'm all right. So you need to make sure that you do that. So let me stop by saying enjoy being creative and I want to thank all my students and of course my colleagues with whom I've had lots of discussions on this and I leave it for any questions or uh, anything that comes up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much sir for this uh, absolutely fascinating lecture. I think uh, all of students, all the students have been uh, uh, very much enlightened by your lecture. So uh, our students have compiled a few questions. Uh, with your permission, uh, may I hand over the agenda to them to ask a few questions, sir? No, please go ahead. Yeah. OK, so Monty, you please take over. Thank you, sir. On behalf of director CSIR NIST and the entire SRTP team, we thank you, sir, for your insightful presentation. It was indeed a great honor for all of us to listen to you, sir. We could not agree more on how elaborately you have highlighted all the significant areas on what does it take to be a scientist. Being a research scholar, I am indeed motivated and inspired hearing your valuable words, sir. No wonder, sir, all the live platforms are filled with appreciation comments from all the participants as well as there are many questions. Sir, with your permission, we would like to begin the question and answer session. Should we, sir? Sure, please. Thank you, sir. So the first question is, do you think the human mind works best when it is under pressure? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, under, under pressure in a pleasant way, yes. For example, I, I'll give you this COVID situation as an example, right? Um, now, we were under pressure to generate large number of ventilators and oxygen generators. It, it, is, it, it, is, it is not a, a mental pressure, it is only a demand pressure. So if you're creative, you, you know that you need to do something for the country. It is a pressure to deliver on time. But that is, that is not a mental pressure of uh, success. It is a mental pressure of delivery. So yes, pressure uh, is useful to deliver things, but, but not if you are pressured to deliver um, uh, creatively, that's not the right thing to do. Thank you, sir. The next question is, do you think spirituality leads to perseverance? Well, yes, I mean, it's a, you know, spirituality in the way you define as being somebody being very calm, uh, able to uh, meditate and be peaceful. You see, I'll tell you, uh, for me, spirituality is also a, a student who can sit in front of his computer or a, or a book uh, continuously for three hours concentrating. It is the same as meditating uh, for half an hour. So I always challenged, uh, including my own son, saying, 
you tell me, can you sit on your study table without moving, concentrating for three continuous hours, which is what you do in an examination hall, right? When you write exams, but then of course you, you keep looking around, but, but what is very important is spirituality is to me is equivalent to meditating and improving your concentration. Thank you, sir. The next question is, sir, um, like uh, planning something, it really happens, but sometimes executing it, it becomes a failure in some cases. So what might be the exact reason behind it, sir? See, the failure, uh, there, there are two or three reasons why it can fail. One failure is poor design of experiment. Right, and uh, the other failure is lack of knowledge of uh, of methodology that you are using. Third failure is typical administrative or the poor quality equipment which you are using. Right, so you need to identify all of these by discussion with people who have done this before or with your professors and say, you know, this is the steps I have taken. So when many students, when they come and my own students tell me I am not able to do this or something has failed. Uh, I can tell you in one particular case, we were trying to work with cells. We were not able to reproduce the data. So we had to have a meeting for three hours before we figured out what was wrong. Because the two students from my friend's group and my group and myself and my, my colleague, we argued and discussed about including washing the uh, uh, glassware to the solvent that is used and all that. So you need to analyze to figure out what is the origin of failure. You should not be afraid of failure. If you're not afraid of failure, you'll be successful. If you don't fail, you'll never be successful. Failure is a step towards success. Sir, the next question is from Annie Jose. What are the difficulties that we face while doing the research and how to overcome the mental breakdown while we get struck at times while doing research? Okay, so this is a very complex question. Number one, you know, first you have to accept the fact that uh, experiment failing is part of life. You know, uh, if it works first time uh, when you start doing a research, that is actually practicals, that is not research. Only in practical, somebody has already done this, set everything up for you, and you go do this and you get results. But in research, you don't know what you're going to get. So there is every possibility that it will fail. And you must be prepared to accept failures, right? So they always say that the most, uh, 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 what, what they call, uh, if you're lucky, you know, all the doors open for you. And who are those people who are lucky? The people who are anticipating failures are the ones who are prepared to handle the failures, therefore they become successful. And if you're not ready to anticipate failures, then you go into mental breakdown, and then you get into depression. And the depression, once you get in, and it actually spirals in. And so you need to be aware that failure is part of my life. And I know I'm going to have this, but I will come out of it strongly. Take a break. I can tell you during my PhD time, sometimes when something fails, uh, I tried three, four times. I really get upset that it's not working. I used to tell my professor, tomorrow I'm not coming to office. Please give me leave because I'm very upset. And he'll say, go ahead. So what I used to do, I used to just, you know, get up very late. Uh, go around, uh, have some lunch somewhere, relax, uh, come back in the evening, uh, relax sometime. I don't touch the subject. I don't think about anything. 24 hours, I just disconnect myself from research. And then next day morning, you're fresh. You know that you have to solve the problem. Then you go back and look at what happened the previous time, try to solve the problem. So you need to be ready to accept the failure. Thank you so much, sir. So there are lots of questions. Sir, if you would permit, we would like to ask you the last question. Should we, sir? Sure. sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question is from Akshay Joshi. He says, being from a conservative family, he believes that getting a job and settling in life should be the aim. So how come he can overcome this in order to pursue career in research and development as it will take time to settle when it comes to research and development? So that depends on the financial state of the family, right? So if they are willing to, you know, nowadays, if you see, uh, uh, if you if you have a CSAR fellowship, uh, 
it is quite quite a reasonably good sum. It's about uh, you know thirty to forty thousand rupees. Uh, if you if you look at the hostel expenses uh, of uh, various institutions, it never exceeds five thousand rupees, right? Uh, and if you want to be even very generous, want to go around spend money, uh, if you are busy with your research, you can't spend more than ten thousand rupees in a month. So you can easily send twenty twenty five thousand rupees to your family, right? And um, uh, if that is that is something helps. So it is important that you can even for five years they give fellowship, right? So it's not it's not difficult that way. And you definitely, if you do a good PhD, um, you know postdocs are immediately available, 50,000 50, to seventy thousand. Um, so it is possible to do. But you need to have to convince your family first of all. And I can also tell you, without uh, research and development in science degrees. It's not easy to get a job with 30,000, 35,000 salary uh, fresh uh, immediately after a degree. So P PhD is a fantastic option with a good income. So you, you, can, you can treat it as a job, equivalent to a job. Thank you, sir, for so patiently and nicely answering all the questions. We feel really enlightened after hearing your informative talk. Your years of experience, research, your deep understanding on science and your ability to explain everything in such an interesting manner has made this session really a great and a really captivating one, sir. Sir, we have a lots of appreciation comments for your talk, sir. So I would like to say just one of the comment among them. Sir Ankita Paul would like to say that uh, this lecture was one of the most clear cut and in a way it can be considered as the mantra for future researchers like us. So I'm sure all the participants are quite enlightened after hearing your lecture, sir. I myself, like, I'm really very much uh, enlightened hearing you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And sir, we look forward to hear more from you. Sir, now I would like to hand over the session to the next fragment of today's program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, based on your talk, our students, they have prepared the slides and it is uh, displayed for, uh, you know, to see uh, from your comment from your side as well as uh, from uh, for the information of uh, all our participants. Sir, are you able to see the slides? Yeah, we can see the slide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, now I request uh, Dr. Biswajit Saha to go for the next uh, segment to offer vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lokesh Aitya. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving such elaborate talk on what it does to take to be scientist. Hope the seven important habits will be nurtured by all young and budding future scientists. I am sure, sir, after today's lecture, they will have very good idea of what caliber and what virtues are required to be a good scientist. We strongly believe that all the participants are enlightened and inspired by your talk. I, on behalf of whole team, thank you once again very much for your sparing your valuable time to ignite the all young minds. We also thank Dr. G. N. Sastri, Director CS and NIST for mentorship and guidance. We sincerely acknowledge the whole SRTP team for successfully conducting the session. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.